Thank you for joining me for our first ever Facebook Live Sourland Steward Shop, coming from you somewhere in the Sourlands. Uh, my name is Carolyn Klauba. I'm the Sourland Conservancy Stewardship Program Coordinator. For those of you that are not familiar with the Sourland Conservancy, we are a very small nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect promote and preserve the Sourland Mountain region. We do this through our mission of stewardship, education, and advocacy. Please visit our website at www.sourland.org to learn more about the history, culture, and ecology of the Sourland Mountain region. I'd like to thank our members who make this work possible, and I'd like to encourage everyone who's listening to donate or to become a member to help support the work that we are doing. Our organization partners with municipalities, land trusts, and other nonprofits to conduct large plantings on public property. And we also want to work to encourage private landowners to do their own backyard stewardship, planting native trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants to help support the ecosystem of the Sourland Mountain Forest um, and all the threatened and endangered plants and animals that are living there. One of the educational tools uh, we provide is an informal gathering um, on a Sourland Conservancy member's property to answer questions about what they can do on their own property to create better habitat and to be better land stewards. Um, we're trying this format uh, as a response to COVID-19 because obviously we can't get large groups of people together. Um, so we're going to do this online format and um, see how it works. So uh, what is stewardship? Basically, stewardship is caring for something like our natural resources, the land, water, plants and animals. Um, it can be creating and maintaining habitats, removing invasive species, planting native species, stream monitoring, and so many more activities. Um, and so some people wonder, what does it matter what I do in my backyard? It's my yard, right? How could it have any impact on the ecosystem? Well, it has a really big impact. Um, appro approximately one third of the land in the Sourland Mountain region is privately owned. And New Jersey, as a state, uh, the NJDEP says that almost 62% of the land in New Jersey is privately owned. So that is a really big part of the, the land around here. Um, so what you do on your property and the choices that you make have an impact on our local ecosystem. Um, and so we really want to make sure that landowners make good choices when they're going to be putting plants on their property. So before we really get started in our steward shop, I wanna go over some basic terminology um, and concepts and ecology to kind of bring everybody up to speed, especially if I say a word that you don't know what it is. Um, I wanna to try to define my terms before I start. And all of these notes and these terms and things I'm gonna be talking about, we're gonna put in a show notes page. So you can refer back to it so you can just relax and listen right now. You don't need to take notes. Um, but you'll be able to refer back to all this information later on. So the first term that I wanna define is an ecosystem. So when I say an ecosystem, I mean a biological community of interacting organisms with their physical environment. So an ecosystem is not just the plants and animals that live in a certain area, it's the physical environment. So it's the soil, it's the water, it's the rocks in that area. Is it a really rocky environment? Is it a really sandy environment? All those physical characteristics combined with the biological inter the biological community is what makes an ecosystem. If I say the word flora, I mean plants. And if I say fauna, I mean animals. Um, herbaceous plants. A herbaceous plant is a plant that is non-woody. So woody plants are trees and shrubs, and a herbaceous plant is something that will send up a shoot or a stem uh, during the growing season, and then that usually dies off during the winter time. Um, a perennial plant is a plant that sends up its shoot and, and stem during the growing season, and then that above ground part 
dies, but the underground system stays alive. And the, the following year, we'll send up another shoot. Um, and an annual plant, the whole plant, so root system and stem above ground will die, and the plant regenerates from its seed source. If I say something that is native, that means that that plant or animal originated here. So it is not from um, another country like Europe, or continent rather, uh, from another area. So um, it means that it, it originated from here. If I say non-native, it means that it originated from somewhere else and then was brought here. Um, an invasive is a plant or an animal. Um, and usually it is non-native, doesn't always have to be, but usually it's non-native. And it has a characteristic that it pushes out all the other um, plants or animals and really creates this monoculture or um, uh, pushes out everything else. So only that plant or animal can live there and it takes up resources. Um, if I talk about trophic levels, all that is is just the food chain. Um, the bottom level of, the, of a, the trophic level are autotrophs, which are our plants and algae. They're the ones that create all the energy that everybody else eats. Um, and then, so you just move up the trophic level. So you have your heterotrophs, which are your herbivores, and then your carnivores and omnivores, and you go all the way up to apex predators. Um, I'm not going to go too much into trophic levels this week, but I just wanted to give that definition for everybody. Um, and a habitat is a defined area that has specific characteristics that allow certain species or are preferential for certain species to live there. Um, okay, diversity. Uh, something that you really want to take into consideration um, when you're thinking about the ecology of your backyard is diversity. So biodiversity, that's the variability among living organisms from all sources. So that includes terrestrial, so that's land, marine, ocean, aquatic ecosystems, so your streams, your rivers, your ponds, um, and how these organisms um, interact with each other. So between within a species, so that's your interest specific, so that's between me and another human. Um, they work between species, so that'd be me and a yellow spotted salamander, which is interspecific species interaction, and the ecosystem. Um, and species diversity, it's another really important term. Um, the species diversity is the number of species and the abundance of that species within a given area. So when we're thinking about what we're going to be doing in our backyard, we want to make sure that we have a nice diversity of species. Um, and we want to have some habitat diversity in our backyard because I bet there is a lot of diversity in your backyard and you might not even know it. So as um, a backyard land steward, where are you gonna start? So the first thing to do is to go out in your yard. Seems a little simple, but I think a lot of us probably have not really fully explored our backyard. So what I want you to do is just get out there. And you can get out there now when it's raining, there's no lightning, or you can wait till the rain stops and get outside and just start looking around. You can bring a little pad of paper with you if you want to, and just start walking around your property, walk around the edge, walk around close to where your house is, and just start looking at the plants that you have there and looking at the ground um, and looking at the sky. Um, because each of these different components will affect the habitat that's there. So for example, in my yard, in the front, I have really, two really big oak trees. Um, and then the ground all beneath them is really dry. But in my backyard, I have a really, really soggy corner um, with a lot of shade. Um, and then I have a slight little hill in my backyard, and I have some open spaces that get lots of sun, and then I have a lot of really shaded spaces. And so in each of these different parts of my property, different plant species are gonna grow, 
um, and different animal species are going to benefit from those habitats. Um, and when you're getting all this information about the different parts of your property, um, you really want to keep in mind that our food chain and our trophic levels, that base foundation, are plants. They are what supports everything up going up that food chain. So you most important thing that you can do right now as a backyard steward is to promote native plants growing on your yard. Um, so the biggest bang for your buck would be plant native plants. Um, you can plant native plants around the foundation of your home. If you don't want to do that, you can do it around the sides of your yard. You can make a really big pollinator meadow if you want to. There's a lot of different ways that you can do small scale or large scale stewardship on your property. Another thing uh, that you could do is remove invasive species on your property. I'm pretty certain when I say all of us have invasive species and, and non-native species growing on your in your property. Um, and sometimes with really large scale restorations, you can't get a hold of all of these non-natives and really keep them down, but in your backyard, um, it's a lot easier. And so we can create these really great rich habitats in our backyard um, by planting native plants and removing invasives and you know creating the space for um, pollinators and other animals, birds, larger mammals to be able to use our, our um, backyards as a resource. Um, so I want to jump in to our first steward shop. So our first steward shop host um, is Lori Cleveland. She is the executive director of the Sourland Conservancy. Um, and she lives right in the heart of the Sourlands. And right now it is March and spring has arrived and there's all kinds of trees, shrubs and herbaceous plants and ephemeral flowers popping up. Um, and it's just a spectacular time to be out. The bloodroot is out, which is my favorite spring ephemeral. Um, spring beauties are everywhere. Uh, it's just, and spice bush is blooming right now. It's just, it's fabulous. So I would highly encourage everybody to get out on the trails um, and just enjoy the Sourlands. So Lori moved into our house about 30 years ago and there was a hedge uh, in the front of her house that was already there. So if you want to see these pictures, um, we posted on our website. If you go to www.sourlamb.org slash steward shops, um, and I think the link should be dropped in the comments of this Facebook Live event, um, so you can go see. Scroll down to the bottom of the page, and it says 2020 steward shops, and you'll see that um, hedge that I'm talking about. So, uh, there are some old evergreens that have been thinned out um, and some of them are going to have to be removed because they're not doing so great. And with all this thinning out, uh, Lori has noticed that there's a lot of invasives popping up. So she went out and she took a bunch of pictures and she's a pretty good botanist. So she identified um, the plants that she has in her property. So I want to go through. Um, and talk about the different plants that she has and kind of come up with a plan for her because what she wants to do is plant some native plants in there to help create a screen, um, a bit of a privacy screen for her, for her front hedge. Um, and if you would like to uh, do the same type of steward shop, you can go ahead and email me. This is for Sourland Conservancy members only. So if you're not a member, become a member. Um, and then you can send me questions and photos at sourlandstewards at sourland.org. Okay, so let's uh, go look at Lori's plant list. So uh, the native plants that Lori has there, she has quite a few growing that hedge. I know it looks really small, um, 
but there are 17 native plant species growing in that hedge. She has marsh marigold, she has an oak species, bitternut hickory, black walnut, um, box elder maple, blueberry, hazelnut, sweet pepper bush, sweet gum, Christmas fern, eastern redbud, spring beauties, black raspberry, shad bush, red maple, prickly ash, and spice bush. Um, so that's a pretty great diversity of species. Not only does she have a diversity in um, species, she also has a diversity in the height and size. She has some big trees. She has some sh medium-sized shrubs, some smaller shrubs. She has some ground cover, um, which is really great for our local uh fauna or local animals um, to utilize that. When I say animals, I don't just mean birds. I also mean caterpillars and butterflies. Um, and then Lori also has a number of non-native plants there. She has mugwort, um, multiflora rose, periwinkle, garlic mustard, Japanese honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, wineberry, burning bush, European privet, Japanese barberry, and autumn olive. So today, what I really want to focus it, focus in on is non-native, so we can just get those ones out of there. Um, and then next week, we're going to focus a little bit more on native plants and picking native plants for your property. Um, so I have a couple examples of some non-native plants that I picked up while I was out hiking the other day. Um, and these are ones that Lori has on her property. So I'm going to see if I can do this well. So this right here, this is winged euonymus or burning bush. Um, it's really easy to tell what it is when there's no leaves on because it has these wings coming off the stems. Um, and each of the branches come off in an opposite pattern. It looks almost like one of those radio uh, things that you use for tracking animals. Um, Another one that she has is wineberry. That's this right here. It's a non-native um, berry similar to raspberries and blackberries. Um, the key difference between the, the native ones and the non-native wineberries is red stem and prickly hairs. Um, I'm not very good at this <laughs> camera thing. Um, she also has Japanese honeysuckle which is right here, um, Japanese honeysuckle. Uh, some of the younger leaves can look almost like an oak. I don't know how to, there we go. They can look almost like an oak leaf. Um, but then as they get older, they start to have an entire margin. Um, so they can look a little bit different. But if you see a vine that looks like this and it's wrapping all around your fence, um, along any shrubs, trees, uh, and they can also come up and it's almost like a ground cover. Um, you want to make sure you remove that. And I'll talk about how to remove each of these. Um, this is multiflora rose. Um, it has recurved thorns. If you can see right here, it looks kind of like a cat's claw. Um, and it has uh, anywhere between three to five leaflets on the um on for each leaf um it's you know this one is uh very invasive and it kind of takes over makes these thickets all over the place this here is japanese barberry i don't know why people are still selling it <laughs> in nurseries it's incredibly invasive um it has thorns um all up and down uh and it creates these perfect little havens for ticks. So if you have it, get rid of it. Um, and right here is an autumn olive. Uh, autumn olive uh, and the back sides of the leaves. They have this silvery color, even a little bit on the stems too. Um, so you can check out on our website at the sourland.org slash uh, steward shops. We posted more pictures um, to help you identify what you have, what you might have. Um, there's also a app on your cell phone called iNaturalist 
that you can take pictures of the plants that you have and use that to help you identify um, what you have in your property. And I think that in general is a good um, rule of thumb is just to go out when you're looking around your property and, and kind of sketching out what's there write down what you think you have and you can use an ID book, you can use iNaturalist. Um, I personally, if I use iNaturalist, I like to back it up with a plant ID book um, just because iNaturalist will give you some suggestions of what it is, but it's not really a, a great way to definitively tell what you're looking at. Um, but it's a great jumping start, especially for people that are not as familiar with uh, some of the plants in their, in their backyard. Okay, so I want to talk about how to remove these invasives that Lori has. So mugwort, um, there's two ways to kind of deal with this. Um, and pretty much all the ways I'm going to talk about removing these invasive species, I'm going to give you two options. So with mugwort, uh, you can hand pull it or dig it out yearly or mow it. Um, but it's going to take a lot of consistent work to get rid of it. Um, I have gotten rid of it. I had a small infestation in one of my flower beds and every year just pulling it out, pulling it out, pulling it out and I'm talking pulling it out maybe three or four times during a growing season and just constantly removing it. Um, but it has been effective. If you have a really large infestation, say if you want to, you have a few acres and you want to create a meadow um, and you have a lot of it in that area, um, my suggestion would be to call a contractor like Weeds Inc. to come out and um, treat that area with an herbicide. Um, I really don't think it's a good idea for anybody to go out and try to uh, spray something like that. Um, I would leave that to the professionals. But if you just have a small infestation on your property, you can deal with that by hand. Um, it's just going to take consistent work going back repeatedly during the growing season and then for years after dealing with it, but you can get rid of it. Um, I've gotten rid of it um, in one of my flower beds. If I can do it, you can do it. Uh, Multiflora rose, that's one of the ones I showed you before. Um, you just gotta be careful when you remove it because it can re-sprout from any part of the plant. So when you remove it, be careful where you place it. So if you make a big pile, the branches on the bottom can re-sprout. So you can try to bury it deep in a compost pile or you can bag it up and then lay it on your driveway or some hilly that's really sunny and solarize it, which is basically just the sun heating up that bag and steaming that plant till it's good and dead um, and then composting it. The issue with multiflora roses, those seeds can be viable in the soil for up to 20 years. So if you have it on your property, it's just gonna be a constant um, process of just getting rid of it, but you can do it. Um, pretty much for the most part, it'd be about, uh, I would say probably a four year battle to really get it out without using herbicide. Um, if you do want to use an herbicide, um, what I suggest you should do is cut the stem as low to the ground as you can, and then um, take an herbicide like glyphosate on a paintbrush and just paint where you cut. I don't want anybody spraying herbicide all over. I really think it's a bad idea. Um, and if you do use it, make sure you have protective gear like gloves. Um, but that technique is called the cut and dab where you cut the invasive and then you just paint the only part that you paint with an herbicide is right where you cut. Um, and that plant will pull that herbicide down and it'll kill the plant that way. Periwinkle is one of the other ones that she has. Um, so that I would dig a trench kind of around your periwinkle. So start about a foot and a half out to two feet out and start digging towards it and remove that entire root system. Uh, take it out, put it in a bag, um, and then just watch that area for the rest of the season and the next season um, and just dig up any uh, periwinkle that's starting to come up after that. Um, garlic mustard. Um, right now is a great time to get rid of garlic mustard. Uh, and the best way to deal with it is just pulling it out. So the reason why right now is a great time to get rid of garlic mustard is that um, there's no flowers and there's no seeds. So um, once that plant sets seeds, you need to 
take it out and you use a bag it to prevent those seeds from spreading. But right now when there's no seed, you can just pull that all out and then throw it in your compost pile or better yet, you can eat it. Um, it's an edible plant. It tastes sort of like culinary garlic, so you can use it instead of culinary garlic if you make pesto. There's a lot of other really great uses for it. It's nutritional, so my suggestion is pull it, eat it. Um, but if you wait until later and it's already set its seed pods, uh, pull it out and then put it in a bag and throw it away. Japanese honeysuckle, um, it's really easy to pull. Um, sometimes when the stems get a little bit bigger when they're old, um, it can be a little bit more tricky, but kept the stem near the bottom of the plant and then unwind it and pull. You can um, do a cut and dab. Honestly, I think you should just pull it out. Um, you can also mow it if it's coming up in an area um, or use a weed whacker and get it out that way. Um, bush honeysuckle, I would uh, cut and remove the whole plant. Um, it can be kind of tricky because these plants can be pretty big. Um, and you can also cut and dab um, a bush honeysuckle. Wineberry, um, it's considered a noxious weed. Uh, it was introduced to the United States in like 1880 or 1890 to be used in cultivating um, our cultivars with blackberries and raspberries. I'm a little torn on this. I leave the wineberry in my property because I like to eat it. Um, it is considered a noxious weed. <laughs> so I think that's up to you if you want to remove it. Um, it's up to you. If you want to remove it, you just remove the entire cane and compost it. Um, it doesn't have a really vigorous root system um, where you're going to have tons of re-sprouting. So remove the entire cane, compost it, just kind of keep an eye out. Um, and you can get rid of it that way. Um, burning bush is one of, you know, uh, it's still sold everywhere. I'm always surprised that it, how easily available it is. Um, you can mechanically remove it, so cut and remove the whole plant. Um, again, burning bush can get really large, um, and the other option is to cut and paint the stump with herbicide. Uh, European privet, you would do it the same way that you would deal with um, burning bush. So mechanical, cut it and remove it, um, or cut and paint the stump. Um, Japanese barberry. Uh, you want to be careful when you remove that one because it can resprout just like uh, multiflora rose. So again, cut, uh, be careful where you place it. Um, you could solarize it, put it in a bag, put it out in a sunny spot and let it get real hot and steamy and kill it and then compost it um, or you could throw it away. And autumn olive, same deal, except it not as likely to re, to re um, sprout from the dead parts of the plant, but cut and remove the whole plant, um, or cut and paint the stump uh, with an herbicide. So now that we've gone in and killed a bunch of stuff, what plants can Lori plant? So she told me that she lives in an area with high deer pressure, pretty much everywhere in the Sourlands, there's a lot of deer pressure. And high deer pressure means that there's a high concentration of deer, and because of that, they're gonna eat plants that they typically would leave alone. So um, it can make it pretty tricky when you're trying to figure out what plants to plant because these deer are so hungry that they're just going to eat everything. Um, and so Lori also told me that she wants to kind of create a privacy screen um, on that hedge. So the plants that I picked are all multi-stem shrubs. Um, and I also tried to pick plants that um, are okay with the moist to wet area and uh, shade to partial sun. And I picked those plants based upon the plant species that she already has growing there. So she has um, box elder maple. And so they t typically grow in wet areas. Um, sweet gum is another one that will grow in a wet area. Um, red maple will grow in a red area. So I kind of had a feeling based upon the plants that are already living there, what would be a good choice? Um, and that's something that just comes with time and practice. 
So I'm going to include a, a link to a spreadsheet that has a list of all the native plants to the Piedmont area um, that you can look through. And that's the list that I use to kind of determine what options Lori had. So I came up with seven shrubs. Uh, all of these shrubs have a really high pollinator value. That to Lori was really important because she wanted to make sure that she supported her pollinators. Um, and remember, pollinators are not just butterflies, they're also birds. Um, they can be flies too. There's a lot of different things that are um, pollinators, but she wanted to make sure that the plants that she picked for her property had a high pollinator value um, and low palatability or uh, browsing potential for deer. So the couple of species that we picked were um, inkberry, which is an inkberry holly. It's in the same fam family as American holly. They have a really nice um, form that, that they kind of come up and they have little blackberries that birds like to eat. I also picked fragrant sumac. Um, Lori and I were actually at Duke Farms in um, the fall and we smelled the, the fragrant sumac and it was just intoxicating. It was wonderful. I think it's a great choice. Um, winterberry holly is another one in the holly family. I think you could have gotten it from the name. It has beautiful red berries uh, in the winter and they're great for birds. Uh, an option for her is American red raspberry. Um, so she could pull out her wineberry and put an American red raspberry instead. Um, and also for her to nibble on. Uh, mountain laurel, uh, which is one of my favorite shrubs. Uh, it's just those flowers are beautiful. Um, and it has, uh, you know, great pollinator value and low deer brows. Most of the things in the Ericaceae family, so your rhododendrons, your mountain laurels, um, button bush, uh, blueberries are in that family too. Um, they tend to have lower deer brows. Um, another one is buttonbush and uh, pink azalea. Um, buttonbush, pink azalea, and mountain laurel all have really showy flowers. So that's always a nice benefit um, to have on your front hedge so that you can see um, some really pretty flowers when you're going out. Um, and so I want to really encourage everybody to support your local uh, native plant nurseries. When you're going to go out and purchase plants. Um, if you want any recommendations of native plant nurseries that we work with, just send me a request at sourlandstewards at sourland.org, and I'll give you a list of the nurseries that we regularly work with. Um, all the staff that I've worked with at these, or at these nurseries have been so knowledgeable and so helpful, and they'll really be able to help you pick out the plants that would work best for your specific needs. Okay, so I got uh, one question. For, from a member for our uh, backyard steward shop. And this comes from Patsy. And she asked, how should I control lesser celandine? So lesser celandine is a invasive uh, flower in um, the buttercup family. And um, it is <laughs> extremely invasive. And a lot of times you're gonna see it um, on the sides of a river or a stream, um, especially right now if you go out and you see the sides of a stream lit up with these beautiful bright yellow flowers and these dark green leaves, you're like, wow, that's so beautiful. And then you realize it's ulcer celandine and it's cool. So um, my first suggestion is make sure that it is lesser celandine and not marsh marigolds. So these two plants can be confused, um, especially when marsh marigold um, is smaller. So uh, lesser celandine right now is blooming and marsh marigold is not quite blooming yet. Um, lesser celandine also has three sepals and, and anywhere between five to 12 petals. I haven't seen 12, but I would say five to seven petals. So the sepals, if you're looking at a plant, and these are the flower petals. The sepals are going to be underneath, right down here, um, on lesser celandine. However, marsh marigold does not have petals. It just has the sepals. So it looks, it sounds a little confusing, but if you look at pictures, and I'll drop some pictures in um, in the show notes to show you the difference. Um, 
And marshmallow gold would also grow a lot taller than lesser celandine. But if you're not sure and you just see the leaves, um, just make sure you know what you have before you take it out. So um, to remove lesser celandine, you need to, there's two ways to do it. And I would suggest doing the mechanical way. So hand pulling, especially if you have a smaller infestation. Um, but the thing with most of their celandine is that it can respout from the whole plant. So the tubers and there's bulblets down there too. So you got to get that whole entire plant out. Um, lesser celandine will spread by all those little bulblets floating downstream and they just go everywhere. Um, so make sure when you take the plant out, you take the whole plant out. So you really got to dig down and get that whole thing out, bag it up, solarize it, and just throw it away. I wouldn't even put it in your compost pile. Just get rid of it. Um, you can herbicide it. Uh, usually lesser celandine, or often less, lesser celandine, not always, is in a wet area, like on a stream bank. You cannot use herbicide if it's on a stream bank. Just don't do it. Um, so if it's just in the middle of your backyard um, and you have a really big infestation and you want to try to use an herbicide, um, you need to use the herbicide before it flowers. So right now it's flowering everywhere. So um, it's kind of too late for this season. So I would say get your shovel out <laughs> and start digging um, and just remove the plant that way. Um, I'm also going to include links in the show notes to any references that I use for the information that I'm sharing. And um, next week we are going to be focusing on native plants and plants that you might want to plant in your backyard. So um, send me an email if you are a member of the Sourland Conservancy. Send me an email with questions or pictures of your backyard and things that you want to uh, learn about and if you're not a member become a member because I would uh, love to have you so um, that's all I have for today thank you all for joining me and I'll see you next week <laughs>